And the situation in which the norite seems to have originated then is by partial molting, here the red indicating the source of the molten material, partial molting of the lower part of the anorthosite uh, crust of the moon, at just about the boundary to where we think there might be some rock of pyroxenite kind of composition formed of pyroxene, and that the norite flooded up into craters which had been produced in the surface of the anorthosite crust. And because it flooded up into craters, it's therefore now quite restricted in its distribution, only found in certain areas, which have subsequently been covered by the gray material, which forms the, uh, the lunar marii. Now then, how about the third rock? What does this tell us? This rock, you'll remember, was the basalt, the dark rock that we find commonly on Earth and is also one of the commonest rocks that's been brought back by the lunar, um, <coughs> the lunar astronauts. Now we know also from the Earth that basalt is also produced by partial molting. It's produced above the, uh, <coughs> in, the, in the spreading ridge area in the centers of oceans by the partial molting of whatever it is lies beneath the spreading ridges. And the circumstances or the areas in which we find the basalt on the moon are the very dark areas. These extensive dark areas over the surface of the moon, the so-called lunar seas. Lunar seas because Galileo, who first observed them, thought that they looked like oceans, and therefore the name Mare, or Maria, uh, the plural. Um, <clears throat> now, those basalts are thought to have flooded up into the large or into large craters, and therefore the rather circular distribution or the circular shape of the so-called lunar seas. And that stage in the evolution of the moon can be shown then on these two diagrams. First, massive cratering, breaking up the norite, which had solidified in earlier craters. That's thought to have occurred about 3.8 3.9 billion years ago. And then, into those craters, flooded basalt. Basalt produced by partial melting at considerable depth beneath the surface of the moon, perhaps 150, 200, or even 250 kilometers. That then was the final active stage of the moon, a succession of floods of basalt between about 3.8 and 3.2 billion years ago, and since then the moon has been inactive. Inactive, that is, apart from occasional moonquakes. And those moonquakes seem to occur close to the boundary between the lunar lithosphere, which is this outer yellow and orange shell, and the lunar asthenosphere. It does seem as though there is an asthenosphere in the moon. You remember that the asthenosphere in the Earth is characterized by some plasticity. It cuts out shear waves generated by earthquakes. And that's the same thing that seems to happen to moonquakes. Here, shear and compression waves are received at the lunar seismic station. But at neighboring stations, the shear waves are cut out, cut out apparently because of the presence of a soft lunar asthenosphere. Within that asthenosphere seems to be, we think, a core. So the moon is very different from the Earth, with a tremendous, a thousand kilometer thick, armored exterior covering an interior asthenosphere and perhaps core. No jostling of plates is possible on the moon like it is on the Earth, where the asthenosphere is very, very much closer to the surface. So the moon is a very different body to the Earth, but it tells us a great deal about the Earth. It tells us about what might have gone on on the Earth during the early stages of the formation of our planet four and three billion years ago. It also tells us that we ought to be on the lookout for impact craters, and this is where we get back to Sudbury. Sudbury sits on the south side of a structure that looks like an egg cut through on the center of that egg is Chelmsford, 
on the far side of that geological egg is Levac. It seems that, in fact, Chelmsford sits in the center of a crater, and the story of the origin of that crater can be depicted like this. Two billion years ago, we think an impact, an impact which fractured the rock in the Sudbury area, producing some rock types that we know as the Sudbury breccia and structures that we know as shadow cones. Then, as on the moon, molten material flooded into that crater. And this is the solidified molten material. We've already seen this so-called micropegmatite and this dark gabbro-like rock when we looked at igneous rocks. These two rocks originated by crystal settling, we think, in the pool of molten material. The dark rock is at the base. The light-colored micropegmatite, generally speaking, is higher above the dark-colored norite or gabbro-like rock. And here, around the bottom of that crater and forming the margins of the crater, is the ore zone that's so very important to Sudbury. Lying above the igneous rock is the so-called Onifing breccia, the rock that the astronauts came to look at, which represents fragmental material that was thrown out of the crater and fell back in and was floated up by this pool of molten material. And then here, represented as the final layer in the crater, is the so-called Chelmsford sandstone, the rather dark, dirty sandstone that forms the rock in the Chelmsford area. That was deposited in what is unique to the Earth in a water-filled crater lake. We don't find the equivalent of that water-filled lake on the moon, but nevertheless, the story seems to be similar to that, which was um, we've learnt from the moon. And then finally, the crater was broken up by these fractures about 900 or 1,000 million years ago, those fractures being produced by the mountains that were built along the what is now Highway 69. And we look at the roots of those mountains, which have been eroded away. So the Sudbury Basin seems to be something of uh, an analogy to what we see on the moon, a similar structure to the lunar craters. Not as big, but uh, certainly not small in comparison even with a crater like Copernicus. Some remnants of it left because the crater was quite large and has not been totally destroyed by erosion. But just to end where we began on a note of controversy, there are those who believe that the Sudbury Basin had quite a different origin, a volcanic origin. And we can see that on these diagrams. There are those who believe that the Sudbury area was once covered by a very large volcano, uh, that volcano being quite active, but at one stage becoming blocked, the lava in the vent solidifying. And because of the tremendous buildup of pressure in the volcano, Remember, it's gas which produces the uh, violence and the propulsive force for volcanic explosions. Because the lava solidified in the neck, gas pressure built up in the magma chamber beneath the volcano. And that that gas pressure was released in a tremendous volcanic explosion depicted here by glowing gas clouds of fragments, and that at this stage, the volcano then began to fracture, and that succeeding the eruption, the blocks of the volcano subsided to produce a basin structure, a shallow depression we now know as the Sudbury Basin. So the Sudbury Basin is also a subject of controversy.
very much like the lunar craters.